All right. Well, hello and welcome back to Tweet Trends. Today, I am so honored. I have an amazing guest on the show with me today. She's an author. She's a speaker. She is a dream builder. Hear me when I say that. She's a dream builder. She's also a podcast host. The name of her podcast is Destination University. And let me tell you before I go and introduce her and everything, when I ran across her podcast, I knew almost immediately. It's like, I need to reach out to her. I need to have her on the show because as somebody who invests a large amount of their time in young people, as a parent, as an educator, as a Girl Scout troop leader, I invest in children and I want them to strive and thrive and do all the great things. And this is what she does. She gets them to that point. She helps them to succeed and in something that's very difficult, college admissions. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our guest today, Dr. Cynthia Colon. Hey, Dr. Cynthia. Hi there, Yvette, uh, or I should say, hey, Yvette. <laughs> I'm excited to be with you today, and thanks for that introduction. And I just love what I do, and I can tell you love what you do, too, and just helping the parents and helping students navigate the college admission process is my favorite thing in the world. Yes, yes. Well, thank you for being so gracious to come on the show and share your knowledge and these gems with parents. And so before we get into the show, parents, students, if you're listening, just take the time to absorb what she's going to tell you right now. You can come back with your notebook. Don't just bring paper. Not, and I don't want you to have a little scrap of paper because if it blows out the window, granted, you can always come back and listen again. But what I'm saying is you need these gems. So just take it in, come back, take your notes because you're going to keep referring back to this. And so just to let you know up front, this is a learning session today. We're taking you to school, literally. <laughs> Cynthia's taking you to school. <laughs> so let's dive right in. Um, let's start with the basics. Where do parents need to start? Like, is there an age? Is there a grade level? Where do they start with this whole process? Well, I love this question because so many people think that what I do is really just work with students starting in like junior year and get them to the, through the college admission process. And the truth is this setting them up for success for the college admission process, I would say 90% of college admissions happens before senior year. So really starting early, I, I think it's great to start as early as middle school. And what I mean by that is, you know, not, you know, sort of, you know, all the, the fervor of, of, you know, let's go visit colleges, et cetera, but just planting some seeds. So for example, in the middle school years, I mean, I'm talking seven, eight, even up to ninth grade, you wanna focus as a parent you want to focus on getting them to create good habits instead of focusing on the achievement, right? So mm -hmm. many of us are quick to say, oh, that's a great, you know, you got an A. And I, I certainly have known um, parents um, and also friends of mine who became parents who reward with financially, you know, for all the A's that you get or things like that. And I say, don't do that. Rather, reward the action, the habits. So for example... You might say to your kid, great job on spending 15 extra minutes a day working to get your grade up. Or you must be so proud of that, A, because of the research and the time you spent to achieve that. So you're planting the seed of like, oh, I didn't really receive that grade because, you know, I just woke up one day but rather the habit of getting into the study habits um, and all of those things. So focusing on um, rewarding the action and the habits, that's going to go a, lo a long way um, as you get closer, you know, in, in high school. So that's my first tip for middle school. Can I, get, can I give you a second tip? Yes, by all means, please do. Okay, good. So the second tip is I'll, I'll start with what you want to end with. So by the time they are juniors, maybe even sophomores, you will probably start to identify what I call the coolness factor. What is your coolness factor? Something that you love to do, something that's specific to you. 
um, and, uh, and that will take you through. I'll give you an example. Someone I'm working with right now, he's a senior, but he's, in, he's an obsessed with baseball stats and he wants to be the GM of the New York uh, Yankees. Well, that didn't happen you know, yesterday. He's probably been thinking about that and dreaming about that and obsessed with baseball since he was in middle school or younger. So I say, really find out what they're good at. What is your young, what do you call them? Tweens, right? Is that the, tweens, the right? Yes, <laughs> yes. So what are they really good at and really encourage their curiosity in that? So that will go a long way. So for example, um, whether they love dogs or kids or surfing or history, praise that. So I'll give you an example. My nephew, Justin, he loves fixing things. And so I might say like, thanks for helping um, install that new microwave. You're really good at fixing things or you're really good at home projects, planting the seed, right? Right. Um, my niece, uh, Naya, who's, who loves music, I always tell her, you're going to be the next Ryan Seacrest. You're going to be the next Ryan Seacrest. So I'll say to her, we play um, Name That Tune in the car when we're driving together. Mm -hmm. And I'll give her a quarter every time she um, can name a tune within 20 seconds or 30 seconds or something. So I'll say, hey, you nailed it today. Good job on that, our Name That Tune um, game that we were playing. So you're just, my dad was really good at this. You're just planting the seeds of things that you can see they're good at and it will spark their curiosity and encourage them to keep wanting to like explore that, that thing that they do. So those, right. those are my two best tips for, for young youngsters, tweens. Well, and you know, I think that's very key because in doing that, that means you have to pay attention to your children. You can't let them go run off and do things and you don't know, you're not engaged. You have to actually look at what they're doing and be interested and excited when they come to you and say things because like you said, it doesn't happen overnight. This isn't something that just came to them that they've probably been honing this craft for a while. And if you're not paying attention, it could very well, you know, I've seen some people look at what their kids are into as a, as an irritation. They're like, oh, there they go doing that thing again, you know, and it's kind of like, wait, wait, that thing might make them some money one day. <laughs> it's, okay, so I love what you just said, that parents have to be paying attention um, and be mindful and thoughtful and just like parents want and wish their kids would get off their phone and sort of you know, pay attention to you know, eat dinner, like have, enjoy this time. The same is true. Make no mistake. Kids know when you're distracted as a parent. And so to same thing goes, same rules apply to parents. You know, you got to get off your phone and sort of disconnect a little bit and really engage with your, with your kiddo. So I'll just say that for me, I, I, I look back now and I loved college football when I was young. I would watch college football. And I don't know where that came from because I'm one of three girls. My mom was one of nine girls. My dad was a musician. Nobody in our ho household watched sports except me. Oh, wow. But I loved, like, I, it, it wasn't about the sport, right? It was about the pomp and circumstance. It was about the rites and, and passages and the mascots. And look what I do now. I, for a living, I talk about college. And I've been learning about colleges since I was young, but nobody, I didn't put that together until much later. So it's just a reminder that that little thing that they love doing, ask them about it, be curious about their interest and they will continue to grow and blossom. Definitely. Definitely. So that's where we are with the early middle, no, 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 the early high schoolers. Middle, middle schoolers to maybe about ninth grade. Yeah. Middle, okay. So then that next step, where does that take us? So as, okay, so first of all, my book, Tips, Tales, and Truths, I always say that book is the best, like a grad, eighth grade graduation gift. So it sets them up for like what's coming. And again, to go back to what I said earlier, 90% of the college admission process happens before senior year. So by like August, before senior year, everything you can possibly do to have control over what's going, what choices you're gonna have by April of senior year has pretty much already happened. So the best thing I can tell you to do as a freshman slash sophomore 
is before, you know, leading right now is a great time to say, okay, what's the backwards map? You know, how can I engage and explore academically as a freshman, as a sophomore? Because what, what parents and teens don't understand or don't realize until it's too late is that you're going to go to school for four years. So you're going to have eight semesters of grades that you graduate with. Right. But you're going to apply to college with six semesters of GPA. So you start building your GPA right away. And six semesters goes really quickly. And so often I hear um, teenagers say, well, I'll improve my GPA in senior year. I'll get straight A's in senior year. And I'm like, that's too late. You know, when you're submitting your application, the, the, the GPA is already, you know, signed, sealed and delivered on that transcript. Mm-hmm. So freshman year, you want to engage in the classroom, understand that you've got to start quickly and get to know your teachers get to know your peers and get to know what your academic strengths are. Okay. So that's what you do academically. You want to know what your strengths are. And quite frankly, you know, if you can take an honors or um, a class as early as freshman year, sometimes you can't, but whatever it's going to, you're going to lay the path work. You're going to lay the, the, the path for later. So um, get to know your own academic strengths and really start to explore, uh, engage that way. The other thing to do is to engage PQs and AQs, academic qualities and personal qualities. So the PQs explore everything and anything. So when you come to high school, you tend as a middle schooler, maybe you were involved in sports, maybe you did some community service, you know, maybe you did some club things outside of school. So you may continue some of those things to hone those skills. But honestly, ninth grade and 10th grade are the best years to try new things. And honestly, even if they don't work out or you end up hating them, better to know now, right? So because in junior year, as we'll talk about in a second, you're going to sort of hone down on uh, and, and sort of be more selective in where you're going to grow and hone. So ninth and 10th grade, these are easy wins. Engage in the classroom as much as you can. Don't show up late to class with latte in hand, by the way, <laughs> right? Um, and explore, uh, explore some things that maybe you always wanted to try you know, earlier, maybe is seventh grade, you had to choose between swimming and soccer and you chose swimming and now you want to try soccer. So, you know, or art, maybe, or, uh, you know, you want to do visual arts, maybe you want to do performing arts. So explore some new things as freshmen and sophomores, because you won't really have, have that luxury by the time you're a junior or senior. Do you have any recommendation for the student who seems to be very tied into friends like they don't want to try something new unless the friends are trying something any words of wisdom for that type yes okay so this is a good question for the kids who um i had this i have a student right now and she's not going to be you know the president or run for office or be the (laughs) editor-in-chief but she did need to develop a coolness factor so um one you can find so i'll give i'll just use her as an example she really loved kids and she, I connected her with an organization that they um, make bead bags for kids with cancer that they can put their like little achievements or every time they have a treatment, they get a little bead and it puts, puts them in their bead bag. So it's something that she could do on her own and she liked to sew. And so she felt she was in doing something great. But then she had a friend, a friend of hers also needed some kind of leadership role. And she too was in the same boat. She wasn't going to like go out for, you know, run for office or something, but they both like dogs. So they decided to join forces and, and say, we're going to go around the neighborhood and see if we can walk, offer to walk dogs for the neighbors and charge them um, a nominal fee for a half hour, 30 minutes or 60 minutes. And they're going to use that money to give to the local shelter. Okay. Oh. So you can be resourceful. And actually, I love the students way more. Like, it's easy to join a club, something that's already existing mm-hmm. in your school. And believe me, that's completely fine to do. But it's much harder. And you have to have a little bit of um, a little bit of chutzpah to like say, hey, this is what we're going to do. So join forces with a friend because and as a parent, encourage that. Mm-hmm. OK, yeah. Like, you know, do you have one or two friends that? I can drive all of you to 
you know, do service, you know, twice a month. So as a parent, you're giving yourself an opportunity to engage in something your kid wants to do, engage in learning about their friends and be a fly on the wall in the car when you drive them there. So you'll, <laughs> get, all the, you'll get all the cheese That's what we say in Spanish, all the, all the gossip. <laughs> That's my favorite place to be, to hear the gossip. That's another show though. That's another show. Well, okay. so, but to the point, to your point about, um, you know, wanting them to do something great, like again, you know, they, there's lots they can do and grab a friend. And then I have some words of wisdom for parents, if it's okay too, for this okay. grade, this level, uh, ninth and 10th grade, again, this is their time that let them explore, let them try new things, encourage that. Um, but you want to be identifying, noticing when they are leaders and when they are just displaying good human characteristics that we all aspire to have our kids you know, grow up to be kind people, you know, um, you know, uh, empathetic, all those things. Mm -hmm. And so again, in junior and senior year, if you can imagine, that's the time when students become, again, presidents and editors in chief, and they've been voted on by their peers for these roles right. or Girl Scout Gold Award leaders or Eagle Scouts and all of these other things that you can do. But remember, students don't earn respect because of the title they have. They've earned that title by first earning the respect of their peers and of adults. So if you can point out as a parent and say, you know, um, uh, hey, Coco, you know, your daughter, like, it was great. I, the coach told me that you helped get practice started when she was running late. That's a sign of a good, both things, leadership and good human characteristic. Mm -hmm. So reinforcing that, that you, that you heard about this thing that she did or, Hey, Nora, I heard that you got started. You know, you, you were really helpful in that event when everything went wrong, you know, when we were at the volunteer event and everything went, you know, astray. So those kinds of things point out and recognize and um, praise, praise your child when they are showing leadership or good human characteristics. Again, um, I can't emphasize enough later down the line, I will often say to a family after I've met the kid and the family, I'll say, your kid is really likable. And they often look at me like I'm kind of like, well, that's a strange thing to say. But I'll say, you don't understand how far that goes in the college admission process. The kid can come across as likable on paper and in person. Not all teenagers are likable. So if you can praise the things that make them likable and make them um, have good characteristics that adults look for, remember adults are making these decisions down the line. Right. So right. encouraging that I think is really a key parenting tip. Awesome, awesome. So now that's early high school then that transitions us into uh, late high school, almost there. What happens then? Well, okay, so this is where, you know, this is my, my, my sweet spot. So talking about junior and senior year and what do they need to do? So we're kind of transitioning our conversation now from you know more global and more holistic about good parenting and good good skills to develop to set yourself up for success but once it comes to junior and senior year you really want to be thinking about um, what's going to happen what's going to happen down the line um, and how am i uh, going to what am i need to, need to do now to prepare so there are three stats you need to know three types of things you need to know you need to know your stats. So get really comfortable with understanding what is your GPA? Mm, okay. Right? What are your AQs? And an AQs, academic qualities include your grades, your test scores, and the number of honors and APs, the rigor of your curriculum. Okay. So really know what your stats are. Really come to understand where you can find in, um, college stats. What is the average GPA? What is the average test score for the schools that you're thinking you're going to apply to? So okay. think about that. And then the third piece is knowing your school stats. So um, we'll talk, we'll go into dive deeper in, later in our next mm -hmm. segment, but knowing your school profile and knowing where you fall in the class. So com the com combination of knowing what your GPA is in comparison to college 
averages and the average among your peers at your school. That's key. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth tip is do your homework. Really know and start to understand. Um, you might want to start to visit um, on the website, learning about colleges. And then, the, uh, of course, the real key is building a balanced list of colleges. So be somewhere between spring semester of junior year to end of junior year, early, early summer, students need to have a list of colleges that they're going to feel comfortable applying to. And so building that list of colleges is really key. And again, knowing those three stats, your stats, college stats, and your school stats will help you do your homework and build a, college, build a, a, a list. So I'll pause there because that's a lot of information. So does that all make sense of that? It does. It really does. And, and, you know, I don't think a lot of people really even know what to do with that information. I know when I was in high school, they told us what our GPA was, what our class rank was, and, you know, and where that felt like, were you in the top 10%, top 5%, you know, and it was more kind of like just bragging rights, like, ha ha, I'm in the top 5%, <laughs> you know, and what did we do with that? Nothing. Right. Did you tell you, like, so to hear you say that and actually lay that out and say, okay, these are the pieces, parts to why that information is good. It's like, oh, wow. So there is a purpose other than just kind of letting other people know, like, I'm smart and you're not. <laughs> right. And, and so many people don't know, like, you know, what to, what to do with that. And in our longer segment, I'll go into a little bit of like how, for example, the, the GPA you see on your transcript isn't the college admission GPA. So you have to know how to like figure that out. So here are the basics, you know, the knowing your, your stats, the college stats and the, and your school stats. And then I think if I can offer a, a good example of how to build a list, right. Uh, I think that will be helpful to, to the parents listening and maybe some of the teenagers listening. So parents always say like, my kid needs help building their you know, college list. And I say, well, first of all, I've never had to help a student find their dream colleges, <laughs> find the ones that are the hardest to get into, right? So you don't need my help with that. What you need help on is sort of the reality of what that is. Mm -hmm. So I always say, look, if you can tell me what your dream college is, I can help you find the, the, the others. And so the list shouldn't be, um, uh, we have reach colleges, which are dream colleges, realistic reach, which means okay, it's a dream college, but like you, you fit in, like, yeah, you could, you could apply and, and, and hope to get in and then 50, 50 target. And then likely most likely. Mm -hmm. So just like anything, you shouldn't be too top heavy and, and, and be sure to include some at the bottom, but you don't need too, too many. Most are going to be somewhere in that target range. Mm -hmm. right. So one of my favorite students from a, a year ago, I'll just tell you this colleges that she put on her list. So you can see very clearly they, it made sense. So she started with Dartmouth and Davidson. Dartmouth was her you know, dream Ivy League school. Mm -hmm. And a close second was Davidson. And if you look at those schools and you see the population and the admit rate, they're similar. One is obviously a little bit harder to get into than the other. And then I'm just going to use my cheat notes here to show you her bulk, the bulk of where she applied was right in that middle, that target range. So she applied to Franklin and Marshall, University of Richmond, Lehigh, McAllister, William and Mary. So those colleges had acceptance rates between 30% and 42%, whereas Dartmouth has under 10%, so it's 8% or less, and Davidson has 16%. So I said, okay, those okay. are gonna be your, your reach and your realistic reach. Then that next bulk is that target 50-50, right. and then she had Allegheny and ben Bennington. So for those of you sort of on the East Coast that are listening, those many of those schools you'll you'll be familiar with. Some of right. you on California, you won't be. But I looked at that list and I clearly thought, A, these all make sense. I can see why she, these are ones that she's applying to. Mm -hmm. they, they match, right? It's not like some crazy, <laughs> like, you know, Ohio State University is on our list. I'm like, where does that come from? Right. Like, how does that even factor in here? Yeah. Like, that doesn't make sense. So it makes sense. And I believe that every school on your list that you're applying to, you should feel like if I only got into that one school, I'd be happy. 
So if it's a school that you kind of go, oh, I don't really want to go, take it off and replace it. Right. That makes sense. Well, you know, so like you're, you're kind of alluding to it. Listeners, let me tell you. So this is the end of the audio show. She gave you an appetizer. Just being honest. This is just an appetizer. If you want the full four course meal, you got to come over to YouTube to see the rest of the interview. And I'll also say too, I should, should mention, uh, you should definitely listen to the, the rest of the episode. I'm going to give you some more hot tips and strategies and, uh, the workbook you can find, you can go to my website and go to the masterclass, register for the masterclass. And there's an opportunity there to get some freebies, but also there's a parent Academy workbook that goes into depth and gives you the actual worksheets that you can do with your team um, in that ac uh, Parent Academy workbook. So there, and those, plenty of resources. those links will be on the YouTube page. You will be able to find her, her contact as well as the link to the workbook as well. So you're good, but you got to go there. So yeah. <laughs> we're going to go ahead and do that little transition on over to get the meal. <laughs> time for the meal, guys. It's time for the meal. Seriously. All right. So now down to the nitty gritty. I'm sitting at the table. I've got my fork, got my spoon, knife, everything. <laughs> Even the, the salad fork. The dessert fork, everything. I'm ready. <laughs> oh, this is going to be good. I like the dessert. I love it. So let's start with your top three to do's for college bound freshmen and sophomores. What, what are those things that they have to do? They must do. Okay. So this is my favorite thing. Okay. Setting freshmen up for success is really key. And I want to say out loud, there are five academic food groups. So one of the first things we do when, when I was a mission officer is I, I look to see how many years of English, math, science, social science, and modern language, or many people say foreign language. Okay. Mm -hmm. So those are the five academic food groups. So that's what we're always looking for. Now, of course, I worked at Vassar College you know, many of the students who come to us are applying to top 100 colleges. So I don't want to be so specific, but just in general, you want to take as many years as possible in all five of those categories. So you don't want to get to senior year and you just are taking, you know, the mandatory, you know, which is like English and like government. You don't want to have senior year with like two academic food groups out of five. <laughs> that would be not good. Okay. So five academic food groups. Start taking honors and APs as soon as you can or that you're eligible. And here's why. It's not just about, you know, I'm not necessarily encouraging like, oh, go crazy and, 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 um, and uh, you want to have some good mental health. Okay. So do yeah. what you can and what's right for you. But I say this because every year builds on the other. So you get on, you know, you get on a path or a trajectory if you didn't take honors geometry, you're probably not going to be eligible for honors algebra two, right? So the counselor or the teacher may not recommend you for that next honors. So again, if you're going to apply as an engineering major or a pre-med, you know, biology major, you have to think I've got to end my, my school years with AP calculus and AP biology. So if you do the backwards thinking, you, you've got to, in order to get there, you've got to start with the honors, right? So, or the reverse is true if you want to, um, you know, major in humanities and English and things like that. You want to end with AP English and AP English uh, language and lit. So just be aware that it's going to, it's going, your first years are going to determine how far you'll be able to get in the, in the other later years. Okay? Yes. Can I say amen to that real quick? Amen. If you are talking about wanting to be a doctor, why are you only doing the bare minimum because you've already have enough uh, credits to, to graduate? 
get in there, take the chemistries, take all of the advanced classes that you can. Oh my gosh. Right. You said that and I thought I was going to fall out of the chair. It's like, oh my gosh, say it again. Say that one more time because I don't think they heard you. <laughs> Make well, sure. Yeah, unless you know, unless have- there's something that you're doing that you need those extra class class uh, time periods. Like I know there's some schools where you can go to another school and take some type of tech type course or computer course or whatever, and you need one to travel and one for the class and then another to travel, that sort of thing. Okay, but come on now. Yeah, the, I think the big takeaway here, and we'll keep circling back to this point, by the time you get to senior year, again, 90% happens before you even enter senior year. You ha- when you're applying, you have to look like what you say you want to become. So you just have to, right? So the, the student who, you know, will, they'll do a, I, I, I offer a 30 minute free consultation. So someone will say, I just had this not too long ago. Someone will say, uh, I want to, yeah. I said, what do you want to major in? And they said, some STEM major. I can't remember if it was engineering or computer science or whatever it was. And I said, okay, well, I see here your unweighted GPA is a 3.85 or something. I said, so you do have a couple, at least a couple of Bs. So where will I find those Bs on your transcript? And um, the student answered with math and science classes. And I said, okay, well, <laughs> let's start with that, <laughs> okay? So perhaps the most competitive <laughs> major is not for you. I'm not saying it's impossible, but you, know, you, you, you have to look like what you say you wanna become. If you're going to apply to top 100 colleges, can that student find a CS major or an engineering major that they can access? Sure, but most of the time they say, oh, you know, I want to major in, you know, some engineering at some top college. And I go, well, you know, everybody else applying to that college in engineering (laughs) has straight A's in math and science. So, you know, okay, I digress. All right, Yvette, see, you're (laughs) get me all off track no but that is so key that is key and I'm so glad you said that oh yeah okay let's talk about uh I'm going to talk about the school profile and then I'll talk about some PQs these are the three again the three to do so the first to do for ninth and tenth make sure you have the five academic food groups on your uh schedule every year possible the second thing is I really want you to understand the school profile you're going to google okay take notes if you're watching or listening right now, take notes. You're going to Google your high school name followed by the two words school profile. So it's going, my high school was Bellflower High School School Profile. So yes, the word school twice, okay? So if you Google that, most of the time, not all the time, you're gonna find a PDF. It's probably located in in the counselor section of the school website. On that school profile, college admission folks use that as our Bible. We learn what the demographics are at your school. We learn the average test scores. We learn the GPA distribution. We learn how many honors and AP courses are offered at your high school. So now I understand the context in which I'm looking at your application. Why is this important? What's important to understand is that students, you're going to be reviewed and judged and admitted or not, based on the school group you are applying with. So everyone applying from your high school to Lehigh University or to Rice University or to Northwestern or UCLA or the University of Georgia, from your high school, we're gonna look at all of you together, okay? So I have my school profile, your, your high school profile in front of me, and I see that your high school only, I'm air quoting here, only offers five APs. Okay, so the kid who took all five APs is the star kid from that high school. I can't compare apples to oranges with the school down the street that's a private high school that offers 25 APs. And the kid over there who took one out of the 25 were offered is going to be looked at a little less in their school group than the kid who took five out of five in this school group. Okay, so we're looking at you in the context. So the admission officer, given your resources, what did you accomplish? That's always the bottom line question. Given your resources, what did you accomplish? 
So given high school resources, given your um, your socioeconomic status, given that you live in an apartment versus a home, your parents are doctors or lawyers versus you know school bus drivers, all of that context matters. So go to find your school profile so you see how we're going to see you. Okay, so that's the school profile. Wow. Right? I was today years old. <laughs> I learned about that. That is amazing. Yes. But that, that's, you got to know that. Like that's gold on the ground, what I just gave you. Most oh parents, even private school parents, don't know the term school profile, where to find it, and why it's important to see it. Wow. Okay. Keep, keep feeding me. What's next? What's okay. next? <laughs> All right. So the third to do, the third to do, it just goes back to the, so those two were your AQs, the academic qualities, beefing up those. And the third to do is really just about PQs and just to go and uh, expand on the exploration of the ninth and 10th grade, the freshman, and sophomore year, continue to explore. Again, you can hone, maybe you were the best volleyball player in seventh and eighth grade and you're going to, you're going to continue doing that. Maybe club volleyball or whatever, keep doing that, but tr also try other things things try new things because you're trying to identify what is your your coolness factor mm -hmm. and your coolness factor as i mentioned in the first segment the kid who wants to be the gm for the yankees you know he's also like a he's a scholar he's a you know a clarinet player he's um uh, he's track and field he's all the things he's got all the things right but i said to him that's not your coolness factor this little thing that you just obsess about is your coolness factor. So continue to explore. Again, parents, I can encourage you more than every time they are find an interest or even a TV show, right? I love all things um, Tudor era or Queen Elizabeth I or Queen Victoria. So I kind of obsess over like the, t the shows, right? The mm -hmm. Tudors, Queen Victoria, whatever. When you see your kid obsessing over you know, a show or a time period or even you know, um, D and D as they say, whatever it is, find interest and see if you can sort of continue to have them, um, pique, pique their interest in things, find other things they can do, find podcasts they can listen to, to learn about or little weekend events to do coding, but continue to explore. So those are the three things for freshmen, sophomores. Awesome. Awesome. So we got the, the younger ones out of the way. Now, juniors and seniors, what are their must do's? So let's talk about juniors. And um, we're gonna expand on, so once you hit junior year, you're thinking about you know, leadership with you know, your, you know, what you're gonna do and where you're gonna become a leader um, with a formal organization or informal or at church or at the home, whatever. But for this piece, I really wanna focus on um, what it means to become the college applicant you want to be. So I have a kid who I've been working with um, since her sophomore year, and she wants to apply to, you know, schools like HYPRS, right? Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I will often say to her, just as part of our routine, okay, she, she'll ask me a question. I say, well, what do you think a student who's applying to HYPRS, how would they answer that? What would their behavior be? Um, you know, oh, should I take, you know, the classic, should I take um, AP, you know, physics or regular physics? Okay, great question. And I, you know, I, I know you don't want to kill yourself, but <laughs> answer that question in the terms of where are you going to be applying to a year from now? Everyone else in the country who's applying to that school, what's their answer? What do you think their answer is? So getting into the mindset of becoming, to go back to our point, you have to look like who you say you want to become. So whatever that means for you. For me, when I was applying to college, you know, I, I, I wasn't the top, top student. I wasn't the bottom student either. But, you know, I didn't have my heart set on, you know, uh, Ivy Leagues. Mm -hmm. But at the time, USC was my dream school. USC is, is, is a dream for a lot of people now because it's mm -hmm. so hard to get into. But, you know, it was, a, it was a pretty average school when I was applying. But to me, that's what I wanted. It was my dream school. So whatever your dream is, think about that and find a way to get in the college mindset, right? You want to read, watch, listen, read things online or, you know, read articles, 
watch YouTube. A lot of students tell me they watch YouTube videos on like a day in the life of and the fill in the blank college and things like that. Just get into the mindset. Um, my unicorn, Jana from Chicago, she's going to Princeton this, this, um, she started, she's probably moved in. Oh my God. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> Um, she said that her sophomore year, she, she just became obsessed. She started watching, you know, those YouTube videos of like how they got into Ivy League schools. She just knew she wanted to become what an Ivy League applicant should look like. So she started in sophomore year watching things, listening, and that's when she found me as well. So read, watch, or listen. There are plenty of podcasts to um, mm -hmm. listen to, whether it's mine, Destination, University, Y O University. Okay. Um, or, you know, listen, get a mentor, just get a mentor and get in that mindset. So that's the first to do. Um, and then the second to do is explore a variety of colleges, sort of like using the Goldilocks method, right? You know, is this, is this too, too, too hard, too soft, too big, too, you know, too small. Uh, so use a radius depending on where you live. I, I realize that I live in a city, so 25 mile radius would easily do it for me here in LA to find a multiple uh, private schools, public schools, small schools, large schools, liberal arts colleges, uh, single gender colleges, I could find that in a 25 mile radius. Some of you, wherever you're living, you might need to expand that to a 50 mile radius. But take your kids to do something easy, right? Make it like, a, like you're going to see a national park. Like just say, okay, we're gonna go visit these six schools over the next course of six months. Make it easy on yourself. Mm -hmm. Not because you're going to for sure apply there, but you're going to just check out what does a small liberal arts college feel like? What does it look like? Do I like it? Do I not like it? Compared to the large un public university in your area. So just start exploring um, and experiencing colleges. I know, you know, since the pandemic, a lot of there's a lot that you can do online, but there's nothing like actually tangibly going if you can that's why i say just use just you don't have to fly across the country you don't have to break the bank to do this as many people think they do just use the template of what you have available to you so yeah um let's see the last major thing major decision that a junior needs to make is the decision about testing since the pandemic we've most colleges have test optional and they really haven't um, moved from that. I think MIT and Georgetown are maybe the only ones that still require it, but decide if you're going to take it. And here's my tip. My own personal opinion is to decide whether you're gonna do the ACT or the SAT. Don't study for both because they're very right. different in how they, how they score and what, what materials on it. So just decide on one and then concentrate on that. Here's the good news or here's the bad news. The bad news is I do still tend to recommend that students take it. Um, that's the bad news. <laughs> the good news is the reason I say that is because it's your choice. So you don't have to send it anywhere if you get the score back and it's not the score you want, or you have the choice of sending it to certain colleges that you know it will help you and not sending it to colleges that you know won't help you. And the third reason is that um, scholarship dollars. Sometimes you get merit aid or scholarships that you apply to that by submitting a test score can help your chances as well. So remember that AQs include your grades, your, your GPA, the rigor of your curriculum, how many honors and APs, and your test scores. So when you remove that third piece, you're, it doesn't mean you're only left with those things. Right. So you want to be left to getting admitted or denied or uh, uh, getting a scholarship or not just based on those two things and you're satisfied with that, then go on with your bad stuff. Right. But if you feel like you, you might need a third piece of quantitative evidence to prove that you've got the goods, that's why I say take it because you, you may use it. It may be helpful. That that's very good advice. I yeah, I can definitely see that for sure. And you know, the other thing you mentioned earlier, your podcast. I love that you interview the students and so that other students can hear what their story is. I, I think that that's genius. That move 
genius. We started doing that last year. We called it 30 for 30. In 30 days, we interviewed 30 students. And um, each one, I was always surprised that each one, I mean, they you hear similar things. Oh, I, you know, I wish I would have taken more APs or, or I wish I would have gotten involved. They all usually say that. But each one has a something, a some tip that is unique and different, you know, for them. So uh, students and parents that are listening, watching uh, the 30 for 30 series on the podcast, um, they, they only run 15 to 20 minutes each or so. And you're going to find a, a kid who, who feels like your kid uh, and that resonates with you. So, yeah. Good tip. Yeah. Definite. It's a it's a must listen. You got. I, I'll give you the link to her podcast as well. You're gonna have all the links, but yeah, it's definite. You gotta listen and and get your kids to listen to it too, because like she said, you're gonna find somebody with a story that's gonna resonate with you, and you're like, oh wow, you know, and maybe you can learn from their mistake or you yes. know take good notes on the things that they did that worked for them that you know can help you too okay so we got through juniors yes now the seniors seniors okay so this is where you know we're bringing it home a seventh a seventh inning stretch and you know i'm a a big sports fan so we're singing the you know take me out to the ball game and and all of that having your last peanuts and popcorn (laughs) <laughs> and this is it. So in the final stretch, this is what you've got to do. So I'm going to just take a peek at my notes here because there are really three things that you really need to know. So I'm going to just say them out loud and then I'll go into d- dive deeper. So you want to know how colleges recalculate your transcript GPA. I know. Yes. Let me repeat what I just said. How colleges recalculate your transcript GPA. What you see on the transcript isn't what they're using to admit or deny. Um, second thing, you want to know the key differences uh, between essays that get admitted uh, versus that get denied. So I'll explain that in a second. And then you want to know, you want to understand the college admission process, how colleges decide who they admit. Okay. Mm-hmm. So let's start with the jaw dropper always. And they're like, what do you mean? So as we mentioned in the first segment, you want to understand, you know, you know the school profile, you want to understand your stats. What is your GPA? But understand that I said the five academic food groups for a reason. Mm-hmm. Those, are the, those are the courses that I'm going to use to recalculate your GPA. So those of you who have religion classes or PE classes or art classes um, or some other um, um, uh, elective classes, those mm-hmm. are not likely to be counted in your admission GPA. So I'll give you an example. When I was at Vassar College, we would... Um, recalculate via raw score using a 12 point scale. So every A plus was a 12 and A was an 11 and then A minus was a 10 and so on and so forth. So I took all the grades and the five academic food groups and I circled them and then I counted up the A's and all of the grades. So I recalculated your GPA on a 12 point raw score, okay? And for those of you uh, in my backyard in California, the UC system has a way that they recalculate. They don't use pluses and minuses. So Lots of things you can learn um, by, by listening to all of the things I offer on my podcast and on the master class on my website. But mostly the biggest takeaway is that if all your A's are in art, PE, yeah. and religion. <laughs> oh, sorry. <boy>. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Not going to have a good score. <laughs> it's not gonna, you know, you're not going to be at an 11 or a 12, okay? So just know that. Um, and But but be just brutally aware and honest with yourself. Again, I'll say to you, I was not the top student at my, at my high school when I graduated. I was in the top 20 or top 25, but I was certainly not in the top five. So, you know, just be honest with yourself. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's that. Now let's talk about essays because this is my niche. This is like my sweet spot. I've been teaching the college essay probably since like 2003. I've been in, you know, college admissions for, for many more years than that, but I finally honed like the the way that we do it. And here's the thing, the end of the day, colleges want to understand you, who you are, what you value, what you believe in, get a sense of your personality. The essay is meant to be a sliver, a window into your life. And the essay is meant to be something I cannot find anywhere else 
on the app in the application. So, so many students make the mistake um, and no judgment, like, how are you to know? I'm telling you what you should know because you don't, you've never done this before. So no one's expecting you to know how to do this. So the right thing to do is to listen to podcasts like this to get advice because there's plenty of advice out there to, to be had. So understand that the essays that stand out are the ones that only that student could write, stories that only that student could have written, okay? So I'm gonna give you an example and I'm gonna use um, myself as an example because I, I want you to, I wanna drive the point home and this, is, this has been something I've been sharing more recently, okay? So understand that they have six to 12 minutes to read your whole application from start to finish, okay? So I'm gonna give you two stories and I share this in my, in my camp. So I often use the example that I valued my having a part-time job when I was a kid, valued it having it. And so then the next question is why? Why was it important to you? Well, I, I learned the value of money. I would save, you know, I was saving for, to, to buy up a car by the time I was 16. And, and I was also having some spending money because I didn't like, to, my parents didn't have a lot of extra money. So I didn't ask them for money. So what's the memory that I use to describe that? I use the memory of having a blue apron that I wore all the time that had two pockets. One would go tips for saving money for the car. One would go for spending money, okay? Good essay, good topic, nice little imagery of the blue apron, the two pockets, perfectly fine and perfectly acceptable. And by the way, it would be an essay that would be better than someone who would uh, just the night before drafted a quick essay about the job because they would end up writing about the job and waitressing and waiting on people instead of the pockets, right? But if I dig deep, deeper and I'm applying to a top 100 school, the truth is my real why, why do I work as a, as a high school kid is because when I was saving for my car, my dad said, whatever you save, I'll match it and together we'll buy your car. And he took me when I turned 16, I had saved up $2,000 and he took me, we found a penny, a, nobody knows what a penny saver is. <laughs> we went to Craigslist, the version of Craigslist. And I found a cute little black car with red interior, a little GTI. He drove me to see the car. And he said, I said, yes, that's the one that's so cute. And see, red is my favorite coat. So the red interior, leather interior. He asked me to give him the money so that he could go and get the car for me. And then he would deliver the car for me. And to this day, I've never seen the car or the money again, okay? That is my truth. So the reason I was still working when I was a senior, even though I was student body president and a cheerleader and really busy and didn't have time to work, the reason I was working is because I no longer, I didn't have a car, I didn't have any savings and I needed to still work to pay for prom and pay for you know, my cheerleading uniforms and, and have spending money and all of that. So the essay, again, is, should be a window, a sliver into your life and, and a story that only you can write and it's a story that I will not find anywhere else in the application. So there you have it. That's my truth. I'm sticking to it. Okay. So that was a plot twist. I did not see that coming. But if I were an admissions counselor, I would so pick your essay and be like, oh my gosh, y'all, you have to read this. Yeah. Right. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Here's the thing. So that leads me to the next point which is knowing how colleges decide who to admit. So um, again, I will just repeat what I said just a minute ago. Ad admission folks have between six and 12 minutes total to read your whole application. So it's a very short amount of time. So you, you wanna catch their attention. And, and so essays certainly do that and, and tug at your, your heartstrings a little bit. But also understand that with 50, 75, 100,000 applications, let me say it again, for colleges that have get 50, 75, 100 plus thousand applications, rest assured everyone in that pool looks the same with AQs. The AQs get your foot in the door. They allow you, give you the luxury. So all the things we've talked about, you got to have the five academic food groups. You got to do this. You got to have honors and APs. You got to whatever. That just gets your foot in the door, especially again, I know I speak a lot about the top 100 colleges, but 
even colleges that are admitting 50% still make a decision. There are 50% that don't get admitted. So everything I'm saying to you is true for any college that has students that they don't admit. They're selecting somebody and not selecting others. So everyone in that pool, whether it's the University of Georgia, Gonzaga University, Rice, Duke, USC, uh, Purdue, you name it. Everyone in that pool has the same eight cues. So understand that your PQs that come out in your resume section and your essays, that's what uh, colleges are doing to help decide who to admit. That's number one. Number two, they're building a class of freshmen. So they can't admit everybody who wants to be an English major or everyone who wants to be an engineering major. They need a diversity, right? And I'm mm -hmm. going to use this word broadly. I say in college admissions, when we say diversity, yes, we, we mean race and ethnicity, but not just that. We mean a diverse student body that's going to major in all kinds of majors, that's going to contribute in leadership ways that serve the campus you know, in the, in the dorms, in the residence halls, you know, on the ba in the band, um, on the athletic teams, all the things. We still have a, a newspaper to run. We still have a, maybe a radio show that we're running or a TV show that we run on campus. All those leadership qualities are going to play a role in thinking, will this student fit here? And then the other thing to know is, this is a little hot tip, right? I'm giving you all, all the things plus the dessert packages. <laughs> so when you notice right? A few years ago, USC is my alma mater. I think I, I might've mentioned that US University of S Southern California, not University of South Carolina. Uh, USC is my alma mater. So not too long ago, although it's been a while, I noticed that they, um, someone donated to build a new dance program. And I think there was a new dance building or something like that. University of Irvine just built some new um, science buildings. University UNLV, University of Nevada, at Las, Las Vegas, built a new medical school not too long ago. So when you see those things, right, know that they're going to be looking for students to fill those spots, right? They didn't just bring in millions of dollars to build a dance program, not to have dancers. Right. So jump on it and say, and especially if you can be front in line, right? I mentioned UNLV, although it's a medical school, so you're not applying to medical school, but rest assured they're looking for ways to feed that medical school. So they're going to maybe be looking more uh, um, lovingly on the STEM majors now because that's now part of their sort of, you know, what they do, uh, what, they, what they're doing and what they're focused on. If they've just built a new baseball stadium, right, spent millions on that, they're going to be looking for good baseball players to fill the team. So be aware, I, for me as an adult parents, maybe you do this, while students go to YouTube and do a search like a day in the life and they look at YouTube videos for that. For me as an adult, I like to um, read, find out who the president of the institution is and find their state of the school because that will share with you what the coming priorities are for the school. So, yeah. Okay. Now, is, is there a website for the state of the school for colleges as well? So you just go and you find, um, look up the president and usually the president has like a bio and like, any, any um, uh, speeches like commencement address or state of the school, you can usually find on the president's page. The other tip would be like um, finding out who the dean of the college is. So whatever you're, you know, if you're, you want to go into engineering, go find, or business school, go find who the dean is. So for example, one of my students was applying to business school, but ha has a love for like climate change and really wanting to be environmentally sound when it comes to business. And we discovered that the Dean of that particular school had an environmental science background. So it worked like a charm. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I'm telling you this. And so I think the thing that people might not realize, Cynthia just laid out a full spread in front of us the the appetizer the meal the dessert and everything and she still has a system that like because this was a lot and so you might be thinking to yourself like oh my gosh I don't even you want me to do all of that but guess what 
that's what she's here for. She does that too. So if this sounded like too much to you, like you, you're sitting at the table and your belly's full and there's still more to consume, guess what? <laughs> Cynthia's got you. She's got your back. She can help you. You can go to her website. She not only has free things there for you to look at, read, digest, but she also has a couple of programs there as well. She already told you the essay is her jam, that like she is about the essay and you heard hers like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so yes, you would be doing yourself a disservice not to go to either check out um, her podcast um destination university that's y-o-u university university <laughs> yeah, yeah. um to check out her website to she even does the free call to kind of see where you are where your head is and if this is for you because this may not be what you need if you're just trying to go to community college down the street or something like that then sure there's an application process and whatnot but they're not as competitive in trying to get in. But if you definitely, because she kept mentioning that top 100, if you, if that is your aim, you're trying to get there, she's the one. Yeah, you know, Yvette, I, I should be clear. The top 100 colleges are colleges that admit under 30%. <sighs> under right? 30%. Under 30%. But most of the students who, so most of the students who work with us either through essay camp or Dream College Academy and things like that and, and take our courses or live courses, um, uh, they are, have at least one of those on their list, right? But we work with a range of students that are, are applying to colleges. As I mentioned, colleges that admit 50% or less are selective colleges, right? You don't, parents, I have seen this happen too many times. Um, as a parent, I know your only goal is to make sure that your son or daughter has a happy future and is happy. And as disappointed as they, and I've had students who were admitted to one or two or zero colleges because they didn't follow. I mean, these are not students I worked with, <laughs> of course, but that, that happens. Right, and right. As disappointed as they are, the parent feels the pain just as much, if not more, because you don't want to be asking yourself as a parent, what could I have done right. more to help set my kid up for success? So I would say if you do nothing else, um, go to the website, you click on the masterclass and it says it's an essay masterclass. But honestly, what it is, is it's sort of a college admission essay masterclass. And there are two options, uh, maybe three, I might, might be misspeaking, but there are at least two options. There's one that's really for juniors and seniors. And there's, there's a starter kit, as I think mm -hmm. I've mentioned. Before. There's a starter yeah. kit. And I would just say, if you do nothing else, get the starter kit. <clears throat> that will give you even more details and worksheets that what I've talked about today. Mm -hmm. And it'll plant the seed. And if ever you need more, you know where to find me. But the starter kit is going to get you a lot of good, good stuff. Definitely. So all of the information is going to be below in uh, below the video. So I, I don't know what else to tell you. We brought you to the table. Can't make you eat. If, you, if it's just not your cup of tea, then I get it. But I know kind of like what she was saying, that as a parent, it hurts to see your child hurt when they get that letter back. And it's like, sorry, you know, but like she said, when you have these colleges that are so selective, 50% and down 30%, oh my gosh, like that's serious competition. And if you want to be up for that, then you might need some help. It's kind of like, you know, you have, so with Serena and everything in the US Open, you know, you want to be a Serena style uh, competitor she didn't wake up one morning and just be there. She needed the guidance and somebody else was her coach. She, you know, she needed that to get to where she is now. And so don't feel bad if you need help, if you need someone to hold your hand and walk you through this process. We're not born knowing how to get into college. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a thing. 
And the reason that I, the reason I do what I do is because my mom didn't go to college and she didn't know what to do either, but she had kept a business card of someone she had met, like, you know, maybe when I was a sophomore and he said, when you're ready, you know, just let me know and I'll help you, whatever. And, and she did, she called him. She said, you know, I said, I don't, I don't, I don't know where to get an application mom. You know, and she knew I wanted to go to college. She knew that USC was my dream. So she followed up a year or two years later after getting that card and she had no shame. She was like, okay, when can we come? And there we were with the Brown Oldsmobile going up the 110 freeway, you know, to his office to get the advice. So that's Mr. Vargas, what he did for me as what I'm trying to do for others. So. And it's a commendable thing. I, I love that you do this. And um, thank you again so much for joining me on today's episode. And um, yeah, I'm speechless right now. I, <laughs> you you open my eyes because as an educator, I know some of this stuff, but there's a lot of stuff that I'm going to need to go back and watch my own episode. <laughs> to get the notes because I've got to share it with everybody that I know because what you don't want to do is get this kind of information and hold on to it you got to share it you got to let other people know because if you don't how else are they going to know about this it's so true it's so true and when I uh, worked at uh, when I started working at a place like Vassar I, I didn't come from a place like Vassar I kind of you know I went to public school and all that so to see what other private school students, high school students were getting access to and the information that their college counselors at their schools were giving. And I, and I knew that I didn't get that in my public school. I thought, I, I've, got to, I've got to put this in a book. I've got, to, I've got to do something. So it took me a while to, to put all that down on paper and get it out to, to, for consumption. But that's the, bottom, that's the truth. Bottom line is most of what I shared is not readily and accessible to about 95% of uh, teens and families that are in high school right now. It just, wow. it's just, it just isn't. I mean, even if your counselor knows it, it's just hard. What our, our student to counselor ratio in the nation is almost 500 to one. And in certain states is almost double that. So it's not that counselors don't want are keeping the information from you. There's just not enough time in the day not every school counselor is an expert college counselor. That's different than what they do. Right. And so my mission is just really to try and just spread like, okay, these are some, the things I gave you, there's a lot, but those are like those are basics. Like everyone, I wish just, everyone just knew these things and, and you'd be at least two steps ahead of where you are now. Oh my gosh, <laughs> we can go on. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, all right. We're like overwhelming your, 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 uh, your viewers now. Well, don't, get, don't get overwhelmed. Just take it one bite at a time. One bite at a time. Exactly. One bite at a time. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for joining us. I really appreciate you. I, I can see in the future, we're, we're going to have lots of communication here because there's, there's so much that you have to provide and offer. Um, any way that I can help spread the word, you just let me know. I want to be able to, I'm on the East Coast. Let me yeah. know how I can help you out here. I love it. And um, once again, thank you so much. All right, you're welcome. Bye for now, everyone. <laughs>